the culmination of Cosimo's cultural campaign would be a book written by his image maker, Vasari. The lives of the artists would seal the reputation of the Medici forever. It was the world's first work of art history. Vasari is an extraordinary figure because he underwrites everything that Cosimo does. He puts all the great Florentine artists right back to Giotto, right through to its culmination with Michelangelo, right at the center of the story of Western European art. And they're invariably Medici-sponsored artists. So he's the great um, spin doctor. He's a public relations expert of the first magnitude. And we've all believed it ever since. The book was dedicated to Vasari's patron, Cosimo I. The author argued that the world had been dark for a thousand years until the light of the artists had illuminated it once again. Vasari needed a word for this outstanding achievement. In what had until now been an ad hoc movement of artists, patrons and protectors, finally had a name. It was called the Rinascimento, the rebirth, the renaissance. This is a crucial book, in my opinion, because it's the first book in which, in, for the first time, someone addresses the issue of explaining why those years in Florence under the auspices of the Medici were, quote unquote, a creative age. This is the first, and in my opinion, most brilliant definition of the Renaissance. The ideals of this Renaissance movement now offended the most powerful authority on earth, the Catholic Church. Humiliated by the Protestant revolt, the Church faced a growing clamor for individual freedom. Determined to impose their authority, they now created an agency of obedience, the Roman Inquisition. The Inquisition could be seriously frightening. You're not called and say, oh, come in with your lawyer, you know, and try to take uh, apart our claims, and there is a jury, and the jury will decide who's right. You come in, and they say, we find you guilty. Please confess. In 1559, l'Inquisizione arrived in Florence. They had come to enforce the censorship of the church. The index of forbidden books was a catalogue of 583 heretical works. To possess or disseminate any named volume was a punishable crime. And the Medici own many of these great works of the Renaissance, from the classics of the ancient world to St. Augustine, Erasmus, and Machiavelli. The list was enormous. And Cosimo had his own legacy and his reputation to protect. Cosimo haggled with the Inquisition and came to a compromise. Cosimo 
organized a token public book burning. Because even a duke could not afford to alienate the church. And Cosimo was desperate to be formally recognized by the most powerful organization on earth. In 1569, Cosimo de' Medici was crowned Cosimo I, Grand Duke of Tuscany, by the Pope himself. The Medici had started as merchants and moneylenders. Over generations, they had climbed the precarious social ladder. As popes, they had governed all of Christendom, but Cosimo had taken them to new heights, controlling Middle Italy from coast to coast. All of Tuscany stood in awe, including a young boy who would one day contribute greatly to the Medici legacy. He would become private tutor to the Medici heirs and the greatest scientist of the age. Galileo Galilei. The world of Cosimo's descendants was the perfect stage for Galileo. If you're an art buff, it's kind of all over. The juice has gone out of it by the time that the Medici Dukes are installed, by and large, give or take. But the scientific revolution is just getting going. Through the eyes of Galileo, a fusion of artist and mathematician, wine became light held together by moisture. As a courtier, his greatest selling point was his uniqueness. He was a scientist. Galileo was one of the many wonders that the Medici court could exhibit. He was appointed as mentor of the Medici young princes. So, on one hand, uh, he satisfied the thirst of, uh, you know, splendor uh, by having at court someone who could entertain and wonder people with experiments and uh, uh, never seen instruments. And on the other hand, he fulfilled one of the new requirements of principality, providing the young rulers with a technical education. Galileo had discovered the uniformity of pendulum vibrations, a critical step in the accurate measurement of time. He had made a name for himself as a brilliant thinker and a troublemaker. But the Medici legitimized his boldness. In 1610, they appointed Galileo royal professor of mathematics and philosophy with a healthy salary of a thousand scudi a year. There was a certain level of official investment in Galileo and given the kind of claims he wanted to make, uh, the university would have not been the right institution. So I, I do believe that he needed a court and uh, the Medici provided that. As Galileo's reputation spread through Italy and Europe, his Medici patrons granted him celebrity and protection. In return, Galileo ensured that his discoveries emerged first at the court of the Medici. this hybrid between a philosopher, a courtier, and a writer, you know, the, the patron expects competence. There's no question about that. But also expects the, the spectacle. Galileo had that, and most mathematicians did not. They didn't have the other set of skills, you know, how to turn a dry topic into something entertaining. School vacations became the seasons for experiments as Galileo's Medici students learned through observation. 